going to be any good or not. But anyway, if you if you see any problems here, maybe just sort of let me know. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, hopefully, what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is something that you already probably know about. It may well be that you've already got a fair bit of experience uh, in this, but hopefully, you'll get a little bit of something out of this. Um, and also, we're going to do a couple of practical demonstrations of things, um, and I'm also available at any time open weekend if you want help with setting up any of your own sounds or any of your own boards and things like that, then I'll be more than happy to help. Just come and see me. Okay? So, we're going to talk about um, this wonderful thing called Padawan 360. We're also going to talk about the vagaries of uh, the Spark Fun MP3 player, um, and hopefully, it just give you some stuff that you need to know. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me first. My name, for those of you who don't know me, is Steve Bogan. Um, I'm from the, uh, the island of Jersey, um, in the Channel Islands. I actually joined Astromech.net uh, in 2015, so I've kind of been around droids a little while, although I didn't get to actually start building my own droid until about 2017. Um, I'm the owner of a small business called Imperial Light Magic, um, uh, which mostly is uh, regarding uh, making custom sound and light systems for cosplayers, uh, but also we expand out uh, recently into the likes of uh, escape rooms and doing stuff like that, and building custom electronics for those. Um, so that's me and my droid. Um, so yeah, I have got one. <laughs> um, and mine actually does run Padawan 360 and uh, the Spark Run MP3 player. So, let's talk a little bit about uh, Padawan 360. Uh, it was originally started by Dan F on the uh, .NET forums and was originally based around PS2 controllers. Uh, when I built my Android, that's, that for me seemed to be the ideal kind of system. It basically did everything I wanted to do in one controller. I was, had quite a substantial experience in the world of remote control uh, before that, and to me, trying to build a Droid, uh, my initial thoughts were obviously to go with what I was comfortable with, which was remote control, typically Spectrum or Futaba sort of remote. Um, but because of the integration of the sound and movement and all the other things that go with it, it seemed to me that putting everything on a, a game controller was just absolute, you know, it was just a, a golden solution. It was fantastic. Um, so when PS2 controllers started to get, uh, get a little bit more difficult to come by, there was a PS3 version, uh, which is commonly known as Shadow, or small help and help Arduino Droid Operating One, and there's all sorts of variants of that going around. Uh, and then it was really uh, reworked by Michael Dan Krauss uh, on Dev.net specifically for Xbox 360 controllers. Uh, now this instantly jumped off the page to me because I had an Xbox 360 and a couple of controllers which I didn't really use anymore. Um, so I thought, well, hang on a minute, let's uh, let's have a look at uh, what this thing can do. Um, and then I found out that it was actually incredibly powerful and incredibly flexible, although it's not without its downfalls, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, if you aren't already familiar, um, there is a GitHub uh, with, for Dan Krauss's Padawan 360 stuff, and on there he keeps that up to date. Um, if you need any of these links later on, then please just come and see me and scribble them down on a piece of paper or I can email them to you. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the pros and cons of uh, Padawan 360. Well, the pros are it's comparatively cheap to set up compared to the likes of, you know, Futaba or, you know, Spectrum's pretty cheap radio here and it's absolutely bulletproof. Uh, this stuff is still very cheap. A lot of people have probably got a 360 controller kicking around, especially if you're interested in this stuff. Um, and it is pretty much readily available. You can kind of buy all these parts still today and start off with something uh, literally from nothing. The the ergonomics of this particular system and the fact that you can control all the movement and sound and animation of your droid on one controller in an incredibly discreet fashion is a massive, massive plus. And that's, that's the thing that mostly um, sold me on it. I walk around with my droid with um, like a, back, a, a very, very cheap black backpack for music, actually from the pound shop. And, I want, and it's just plain black, very, very thin. I actually wear it over my front with my hands slipped in the zip pockets, and I can control my droid without anyone even knowing I'm doing it. Sometimes I walk around with a controller behind my back, and it's absolutely intuitive. And it's such a small little controller, and so easy to handle, that you can easily drive around with your hands behind your back, and no one will even know it's you. I've literally had people come up to me saying, Do you, have you got any idea who's controlling that droid? And I've gone, not a clue. And it's great, you can be as discreet as you want. Um, 
um, and, and say from, a, from an actual ergonomics point of view, the fact that you can control it behind your back and you out even looking at what you're doing is a massive, massive plus. Um, it's also a very configurable system and we are going to talk about that in a, in a moment. We're actually going to go and have a look at the code itself and I'll show you a little bit how you can configure things to your particular requirements. I'm going to show you one or two things that I've done specific to mine, which just suited me and my style. Um, okay, so that's some of the pros. Uh, some of the cons. It can, it can be confusing to newcomers. If you are used to remote control uh, and RC and you've got a transmitter and a receiver and you plug in some servos typically, or you know, in our case you'd be plugging into a speed controller, then suddenly breaking out into the world of Arduino is a little bit daunting if you've got no experience with it before. However, do not panic, there is so much support available throughout the club and also on the forums. Um, you know, all you have to do is ask and someone will jump in with an answer nine times out of ten within a couple of hours. Very, very, um, very, very straightforward to get your head around once you've got over that initial fear factor. One of the other comments that was mentioned yesterday in, the, uh, in one of the uh, talks about getting tier two level clearance. Uh, at the moment, these controllers are tier one clear only. Okay, you cannot have a tier two droid operating on this. And that's mostly because of the concerns around other radio traffic noise. Um, I know that the Xbox controllers operate at 2.4 gig frequency, uh, but they're not as uh, bulletproof as the like of Spectrum and Futaba, which use all sorts of frequency hopping stuff. Um, those remote control systems are designed with noisy environments in mind. Uh, they've also got obviously a much more powerful uh, transmitter, so their range is much, much better as well. They'll cut through other traffic. Um, it is possible in a very noisy, when I say noise, I'm talking about radio noise, um, that you could potentially get some problems with your uh, Xbox 360 controller. Out in the open air, fine, you could probably go 100 yards or so, um, but in a sort of enclosed space with all sorts of routes and things going off, uh, it's, that's one of the major reasons why at the moment it's not clear to use as a tier 2 droid, in which case you need to switch to a remote controller if that's something that you're looking to do. And it's not perfect. It's blooming good. It's really blooming good. But it's not perfect. There are still little idiosyncrasies here and there, and the odd little thing that may catch you out, I'm going to mention one in particular that I've been caught out with, uh, which is a reason to say it's not perfect. Okay, so let's talk about the hardware that you need uh, to run this particular system. Well, the first thing you're going to need is an Arduino Uno or Mega, or something similar to that. Um, the, the, the typical sort of hardware environment is to start off with uh, something like an UNO. You're then going to need some way of talking to USB through that UNO. And typically that's something like a USB shield. Uh, for those of you who haven't got this sort of um, knowledge at the moment, a shield is basically an expansion board that plugs in right on top of an existing Arduino. So you literally start stacking these things up. They are designed to plug one on top of the other, okay, like a sandwich. And what it does is all the pins and everything connect for you through that way, and then all of a sudden it turns your standard Arduino you know, into something that's got USB. Once you've got USB, you can then plug in the next thing, which is an Xbox 360 USB receiver. Now, whilst I personally always try to go for the sort of cheapest things I can get, just be slightly mindful of this one. Um, I have seen on the forums a couple of times, even in the last few days, where someone's had problems trying to get a, um, a 360 receiver that they bought off Amazon working with their system and we're getting all sorts of problems with it. So just bear in mind, it might be an idea to kind of go for an original Xbox receiver for this particular part of it. It's going to cost you a couple of quid more, but in the grand scheme of things, it's going to save you a lot of air. Ask me. <laughs> you're also going to need, obviously, an Xbox 360 wireless controller. Now, the whole reason that you're looking at this is probably because you've already got one kicking around the house. If you don't, Go and buy one, they're pretty damn cheap these days. Then you're going to need some way of actually controlling what goes on in your droid. Uh, now the, the typical way of doing this is to use something like a Siren 10 for your dome controller and a Sabertooth uh, drive controller for your main drive, be it a 2x25 or a 2x32. Uh, certainly when I put my droid together, for some strange reason it was actually cheaper to buy a 32. Um, 32 is also a lot more programmable and configurable, so it probably makes sense. It is a bit of an investment, okay? 
but you didn't get into this hobby because it was cheap. All right, so don't scrimp out on this stuff. The other thing as well is by standardizing on these kind of things, all of the libraries and all of the knowledge has already been built and it's been done for you. So it's, I'm a big, big believer in buy once, buy right. Okay, it may cost you a little bit more to start off with, but by God, you're gonna get that money back in lost, you know, lost effort in getting it working. Because it's already, it's already been done. Uh, if you need any servos, um, they can also work with Paddle 360 stuff. Um, the basic sort of basics of getting a droid up and running, you probably won't actually need any servos, but if you want to start doing clever stuff, um, then it's all capable of doing that, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. And then finally, for your sounds, um, the typical route is to go with the Spark Plug MP3 player. Uh, or MP2 trigger, which runs off, sounds off a micro SD card, and we're definitely going to spend a little bit of time talking about that because it's got its own set of challenges. Um, again, no reason why you have to go with that, but the code is written with that in mind, so if you decide to go with a cheaper kind of MP3 playable, and it's certainly available, um, then you know, you're going to look at rewriting the code. It's all a question of how much is your time worth. If you want to spend loads, if you don't mind spending loads and loads of time coding, and yeah, this is something you enjoy doing. By all means, go for a cheaper MP3 player, rewrite the code. It's entirely up to you. But, out of the box, download the code, stick it on your Arduino, it's going to support your Spark Fun board. Okay, uh, finally, obviously, you need a way of getting the sounds out of your droid, so an amplifier and speakers is a good idea. Um, there's all sorts of amplifier boards and variants. Um, I started off with one of those little amplifiers, it's known as a motorcycle amplifier if you buy it off AliExpress or Amazon, about sort of 12, 15 pounds. More recently I've moved over to, uh, it's a TP3116 mono amplifier, which is basically an amplifier on a board. They are incredible. Uh, about three pounds off AliExpress, and it knocks the motorcycle board into the top hat. Far, far more powerful. So that's something you can consider doing. If you're not familiar with Padawan already, um, one of the beauties and benefits of it is that you can actually control the volume remotely. So through, through the controller itself, you can adjust the volume up and down. We'll have a look at that sort of stuff when we come to the code. So talking of the code, obviously there's some software involved. Um, if you're completely unfamiliar with Arduino, you need something called an IDE, which is basically the way that you uh, program an Arduino, you talk to it through your computer. Uh, you're also going to need something called drive sort. Okay, this is a little application uh, freely available on the internet, or I can copy it onto a USB key if you need a copy of it today. Um, drive sort you will need when it comes to talking about the Spark Plug MP3 player, and we'll touch on that when we get to it. You're going to need some music or some sound files, some MP3 files. Again, fairly freely available. Um, and if you need anything in particular today, please come and ask me, and I'll copy it for you. You're also going to need the sketch or a variant of that sketch. Uh, with, uh, if, if you don't know what a sketch is, a sketch is effectively the program for your Arduino. It's actually pretty straightforward to read. We're going to be having a look at one very shortly. You're also going to need what's called libraries. Uh, and these libraries are little sort of compact sections of code that have already been written for you which will talk to the various bits of the rest of your build. So there's, <coughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a library called Sabertooth for the siren, one called servo.h, there's one for the mp3 trigger, <coughs> one, bless you again, one called wire, and then finally there's a specific library for your Xbox receiver, okay? Now the nice thing is all you do in the code is you actually tell your system to include all those. So long as you've actually got the libraries on your computer, it all just happens magically, it's great. So, Let's take a look. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and have a look at the actual Padawan sketch, which I conveniently got loaded up here. Now, I mentioned one of the things I mentioned was there's, there's different variations to this code. Okay, Dan obviously wrote the uh, wrote the original based heavily on the, uh, the sort of the shadow stuff in the original Padawan. Uh, this is actually my own cut of that code. And what I've done, if those of you are familiar with Padawan, you'll know that uh, the main body drive is on the right-hand stick, and also the sounds are just on the right-hand side as well, so if you're trying to do sound at the same time, you maybe have to reach across with your left hand, and the left-hand stick is typically for the dome. Well, for me, I was quite a heavy gamer, 
um, and moving on games almost exclusively with the left stick. So to me it made sense to switch the control so that all my driving was on the left stick, which meant my right thumb was then clear to do all the sounds and all the dome movement completely independently of where I was driving the droid around. I could even drive with one hand with one hand behind my back quite happily and sort of talk to people because I was holding it was just more intuitive for me to do. So I, I changed the code ever so slightly, very, very simple, and again, we'll, we'll sort of have a look at that, um, to build the left-hand drive version, okay? This particular kind of code is also known as the Corvus code. Um, there was an issue that occasionally popped its head up on the uh, Dan Krause code, where it would turn in one direction far faster than it would turn in the other direction, which is exactly what I had when I first put my droid together. Um, found out that this was a known issue, this guy called Corvus had basically fixed it. So that's the color of the Corvus code, so it was version 1.1 by Rob Corvus. And as I say, I've, I've added what I call left-hand drive to it. So let's have a little scroll through the code, see so what we've got. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with the way that Arduino works, um, whenever you've got either a double slash at the uh, start of the line or a slash in the start, it will effectively do that as a comment, so whatever, whatever you see after that is not actually read by the, uh, the code. So all of this stuff here uh, is uh, commented stuff. Now, if I would highly, highly recommend, if you're not familiar with it, have a look through all of this stuff, read it, okay? Don't just scroll past it if when you read it, when you get it up on your computer, because it does tell you everything you need to know. It's gonna tell you as much as I'm gonna tell you today. So it tells you what hardware you need, what software you need, what libraries you need. Uh, it recommends your Sabertooth settings, because I know that was, that was something I had fun in games with, trying to get my drives working and talking directly to the board, over the correct board rate and all these sorts of things. Um, there are recommended settings for the dip switches on the, on the uh, Sabertooth controls here. Uh, likewise for the siren. Okay, so we'll get down into some of the means of it. Um, again, to, talking ergonomics and ease of control, one of the beauties about Padawan is that you can even select how fast your droid is going to drive at any point. Uh, effectively, you're, you're adjusting its sort of maximum and minimum uh, speed. So what we've got here, right at the very start of the sketch, is three different variations. Now on the Xbox controller, when you adjust the speed, the actual little green ring that normally spins around on your Xbox controller to tell you you're connected turns into your speed uh, level. So if you're on level one, the first segment lights up. If you're on level two, the second segment lights up. If you're on speed three, the third segment lights up. And it also gives you a sound feedback as well. So your droid will tell you audibly what speed setting it's in as well through different sort of sound events. Very, very slick sound. Uh, you can't do that with remote control as far as I know, unless maybe you've got a three position switch, you could possibly do something like that. So basically, yeah, we start off by telling, uh, telling the system just how fast those boundaries are. Now, if you're running a 12 volt system, you may have the settings perhaps similar to what I've got here. If you're running a 24 volt system, then maybe you might want those settings to be dropped down a bit. So you can totally, totally change this to whatever suits your needs. Um, the next section is to do with how fast the droid will turn on the spot. So you've got a turn speed, mine's uh, set to 70 as you can see here. And then you've got your dome speed as well. Now your dome speed, is a lot of it's going to come down to what kind of drive motor you've got on dome and what the gearing reduction is on it. A lot of people use the pull, pull drives. Um, I actually used a cordless drill motor on mine. So I've literally got a cordless drill head. Um, one of the reasons I did that was A, I'm a cheapskate, uh, I had a spare drill kicking around that was knackered. Uh, the other thing which actually really works for me, and some of the kind of events I take my droid to, uh, is the fact that the drill motor has got a clutch built into it. So if you were spinning that dome around and suddenly a kid tries to grab hold of it, the clutch will slip as opposed to it taking the kid's arm off. Sometimes I do the clutch up tight just to take the kid's arm off. <laughs> Let the wood be um, in the sketch as well, you can also control what's known as ramping. Now, ramping is basically how fast your droid accelerates. So, in other words, if you if you're at a standstill and you go to full speed, you can build in a certain amount of ramping up of that speed. Okay, it's like an exponential setting, if you like. If you use remote control, it kind of just gives you a soft start, for want of a better description. 
And again, all of these settings are totally free for you to change. You set it as exactly as you want it. This is one of the beauties of doing this stuff with Arduino. Uh, the next thing it talks about is something called dead band. Uh, now, any kind of controller, be it a remote, you know, traditional remote control or the Xbox kind of controllers, has just got a little bit of kind of wiggle movement right in the middle, and that's what's known as dead band. Okay, so what you want is for your droid to not be moving when the stick's in the middle. And sometimes if you just give it a tiny little bit of pressure, it might start moving, okay? So you can increase the size of what's called this dead band, or dead zone, and it just means you've got a little bit of leeway on that stick before the actual drawing starts moving. You'll notice whilst I'm, talk whilst I'm doing all these talks, I'm talking using my left thumb, because that's how I drive my droid, and for gamers, you're probably using your left thumb most of the time for, you know, controlling your character around whatever game. Uh, okay, so then we talk about uh, some, some Communications kind of stuff, so we talk about how we're going to talk to uh, the Siren 10. Uh, now, there's different ways of doing that. I'm not going to dwell on that too much. Um, for the most part, the standard code will work just fine. And then we get on to some of these definitions and inclusions. Uh, so, on mine, um, I've got a equivalent of a fire extinguisher fitted. Uh, it's basically an inverted aerosol can, and there's a servo attached to that, so I told it that's on pin 3. So if I want to give a blast of jet air out of mine, just to scare the kids off, uh, then mine's on uh, pin three, and that's why another reason why I need to include the servo library as well. Uh, please don't use butane, because blowing out cameras at kids' parties gets very exciting if you use <laughs> butane gas. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to tell the Arduino sketch that we need to include the Sabertooth library. So if you're, again, if you're not familiar, uh, when you see a dot .h after a word, that implies that it's a library, it's a section of code that's already been written for you by the manufacturer or by someone else, and all you have to do is say, right, I need you to include this as part of what you're going to do. It means you don't have to tell the system how a server works and how far, you know, you don't have to do all that, it's already been packaged for you, okay? So definitely worth getting hold of these uh, libraries. So we've got Sabertooth uh, to talk to your drive controller. We've got the Siren Simplified, which basically talks to a dome controller. Servo, as we mentioned, uh, mv 3 trigger.h, you're going to need that to be sparked by an MV3 board. Uh, Wire.h, which is a general sort of communications thing around your droid. And then finally, there is one specific to your Xbox receiver. Okay? So again, if you've got a pattern version of an Xbox receiver, it might be that this library doesn't work with yours. So this is potentially where you're going to fall down. Yes? Where do you find the libraries? Uh, freely available on the internet. Just search. They're all over the place. Yeah, literally just search for Xbox 360 receiver library on Arduino, it'll be right. Very, very simple to get hold of. Again, if you if you want any of this sort of stuff, please come and see me at any point during the weekend. I'll be more than happy to help you out. Uh, we're also going to tell you that we're using something called software serial. Now, um, with Arduino, it's got two different ways of talking over serial, okay? And you're going to be potentially communicating with another Arduino, maybe in your uh, dome, which is going to control panels and lights and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so there's what's known as hardware serial, which will use the TX and RX ports on your Arduino, or the software serial, and software serial you can say to use whichever port you want. So we're including software serial just for fun games. And we're going to say that it's a software serial in our case is actually going to be what's controlling the Siren 10 and the Saber 2. Okay, so we're not using hardware serial ports because we, actually because we've got two things and we have to use soft, a software version of it. Uh, okay, carrying on through the sketch, uh, we've got some definition sort of stuff. We're basically saying what kind of boards we've got, or what kind of speed controllers we've got. Uh, and then we're going to do set some defaults for starting up. So basically, this is saying what's our volume going to be when we start to draw it up. And typically, you don't want your volume flat out because then it gives you no leeway to increase the volume if you need to. So, what I do on mine, if I'm going to be at an indoor event, I'll set the amplifier to preset reasonably down and I can control it up or down on the transmitter um, as and when I need. If you're going to be at a comic con, set your amplifier to flat out now and then adjust the volume on the controller as you need. It just gives you a little bit of headroom just to increase the volume if you want, because we're not starting with the coding saying to drive your smartphone flat out. Uh, okay, let's have a look. We've got some sort of clever stuff here, which basically says set everything to zero. Now, this is in, this all that, that stuff is pretty important because 
this will get referred back to in the event of a loss of connection between your transmitter and your receiver. Okay? One of the most important things that you're going to get judged on on your MOT is fail safe. You, mu you must, must, must have fail safe on your droid. What that means is if your transmitter suddenly dies, if you take the batteries out, if it gets knocked out of your hand and falls on the floor, your droid is going to stop if it was moving. The dome is also going to stop moving if it was moving already. Okay? The last thing you want is to lose connection and then for your droid to run off into the distance. Fortunately, not touch it. That was pretty good at handling that. Uh, okay, so on mine, I've got some stuff about telling you whether my servo is on or off, uh, which is quite important because you don't want your gas canister suddenly emptying itself when you turn the droid on. Uh, and then what we do is we say, okay, let's go and start talking to our Xbox receiver over USB. Uh, again, if you're unfamiliar with Arduino stuff, um, all we've done there is we basically said, this is a load of, we told the Arduino, this is stuff you need to know about, okay? Just kind of stick that in your memory and just keep it there. Uh, we then go into what's called void setup. Uh, you're also going to see shortly something called void loop. The void setup is a bunch of code that runs once when your Arduino is powered up, okay? It is setting the stuff up. Um, very, very useful. So basically, we're telling it to uh, write um, servo positions. We're basically telling it to start communication with the siren 10 if it's been defined. Uh, or we can say, okay, if it wasn't defined, you can use auto forward rate. In other words, it will actually try and figure out its communications itself. Uh, so on my, uh, I then tell it to actually begin communication with the, uh, the saber tooth at my time board, which is a common, common speed to uh, talk to um, serial things. And again, all of this stuff, all of these comments here have been written by Dan, very, very useful. So have a, have a read of this stuff, it really does mean, uh, you know, it, it's written in plain English, and it's nice and easy to understand. I'm just gonna skip past a couple of things here about all the setting up. So, this is where I tell my servo, which was the library, we saw the library called myservo.h. So I say, my servo, attach onto servo pin, and I've declared the servo pin right at the top of the sketch, which was on pin three. Um, then I'm gonna tell it to uh, set up the communication with the main pin three trigger, and set the volume to whatever the volume variable we set a little bit earlier was. Okay, so the next bit is stuff I don't personally use, but uh, this is where you would actually start uh, your connection to your dome Arduino if you've got one. So if you've got like TCs or something like that, you can actually tell uh, your, your main body controller to talk to your dome. And you do that over something called I2C, uh, sometimes referred to as I2C. Uh, this, this is a built in method or protocol for Arduinos to communicate with each other. So this is, this is something that if you want to be able to control what your dome's doing through your controller, you will need to get a little bit into I2C and get the two Arduinos talking to each other. Uh, again, not particularly difficult. Personally, I don't use it. So that's where that gets set up. Okay, and that's, that's it for the setup. So now we're into the meat of how this code works and what's known as the void loop. So what a void loop is, again, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the converted here already. But the loop basically runs through start to finish, and when it gets to the bottom, it goes back to the top and repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats. And repeats. Something ridiculous like 16,000 times a second, or something crazy like that, okay? So this is where we need to be slightly careful in that anything we alter here could have a profound impact on anything else that's in that loop. So if, if for example, we tell it to, to pause, to, you know, to delay for a short amount of time because we wanted to do something, then that's gonna affect the rest of your loop. Okay, so, and don't forget that it's going to do that delay every time it runs through that loop. So if you suddenly start putting in delays because you want a servo to open for five and a half seconds, your code stops for five and a half seconds, okay? It's a little bit, as an analogy, thinking about if you're cooking dinner in the microwave, okay? If you, um, if you slam the door in your microwave, set it for five minutes, Putting a delay into your code means you have to stand in front of that microwave for five minutes. You can't go and do anything else until that job is finished, okay? So you probably want to do something else that you can say, right, go do that for five minutes, I'm gonna go off and do something else, in which case you wouldn't use a delay. 
right? So be very, very careful with the delays. They seem to be a really, really good solution for things until you actually understand what it's doing. It is stopping your code. It absolutely stops it there. Okay, so uh, we're going to basically check if our Xbox receiver is connected. Now this is really, again, really, really important, okay? So this is where your uh, failsafe starts coming in. Because the first thing, you notice the very first thing in our loop it says is are we connected to basically is the receiver talking to the transmitter. Okay. So basically what that says is if we're, if we're not connected, then set all the values to zero, which stops you from you getting its tracks, or it should do once you set everything up correctly. After the controller connects, it basically tells us to blink all of the lights, and it will start the, uh, the little green segment rotating. Now notice again, that in order to get that little green, uh, the green segments rotating, all we have to do is use the Xbox library, tell it to set the mode for rotating. Okay? We haven't done anything at this point to say, the animation for rotating is, you start with this one, you turn it on for half a second, then you turn it off, and then you move to the next one, you turn it on for half a second, then you turn it off, and then you, we haven't had to do any of that, we've just gone, use the Xbox library, rotate. And the library looks after it for you. The thing, the thing you have to kind of understand with, uh, with the likes of Arduino is it's actually incredibly basic. Okay, it's very, very black and white, very straightforward. It does what you tell it to do. There's a lot of ways of helping your stuff by using the likes of libraries, and they are absolutely essential. Um, but otherwise, that code will execute how you told it to execute. Okay, if it's not doing what you're expecting it to do, don't blame the Arduino. Because the Arduino is doing what you've told it to do. Okay? It's a bit of a mindset that you have to get into that you can't just expect it to do what you're thinking. Okay? If you're thinking, right, well, what I want it to do is to uh, turn left at this speed, and if it turns left at a different speed, it's not the Arduino's fault. Okay? You have to adjust that to do what you, the result you're expecting to get out of it. Uh, okay, so we'll uh, have a bit of time. We'll, we'll skip on a little bit. Um, so what we're going to do here is say when we first connect, in other words, if our connection is true, then in my case it's going to go to the MP3 trigger and it's going to play track 21. So I get an audio cue from my from, from my droid that my controller is now connected. Okay, it go I oh, can't whatever the whistle is that mine does. And it will tell to say, okay, rotate the, uh, rotate the little uh, thing. Now, at this point, my controller, whilst it's connected, cannot drive, okay? I can move those sticks around and nothing will happen because I haven't told my droid that I want to take control of it, okay? I've got control, um, I've got connection to it, but I haven't actually told it that we're going to go out to do anything, and that's exactly what comes next. It basically says, listen for any buttons that are pressed on the Xbox controller, if I press L1 and uh, R1 at the same time, I can disconnect the drum. So I can actually, that's about the only way you can turn your controller off. So if I want to turn my controller off, say, you know, I'm at a Comic Con, I want the droid powered up, but I don't want to waste the battery on my control on my uh, transmitter, I can just turn my transmitter off by holding R1 and L1 at the same time. Brilliant. The only other thing you can do is take the battery out. And of course, as soon as that connection is lost, that code, that loop has run through so fast, it goes back to the top and it says, are we connected? Suddenly finds we're not, sets all the motors to zero. Okay, fail the same. Which again, goes back to my point about not putting things in this code that are gonna stop that code from executing, okay? Because if you do that, you will lose your fail state. Potentially. Uh, okay, so then it says, uh, okay, if we push the button known as start on your controller, so on your Xbox 360 controller, just to the left of the little uh, circle, of, uh, circle of life on it, you've got a start button. So the way this code is written, it says if you push start, that's where we can actually take the control of our code. So it says, uh, it now says, okay, we've now got control of uh, our drives. 
gives us another audio cue. So it lets us know that we've got control of our drive through this MP3 trigger to play here. So we'll play track 53. And it will also then set the LED segment, be it 1, 2, or 3, depending on how fast we're going to be driving that droid. And again, the speed of that is controlled uh, on mine via, I think it's a click down of the left thumbstick. And uh, I believe that comes up. And another section of the code. Okay, so the other nice thing you can do with, uh, with Padalan is put it into what I describe as a track mode, okay? What this does is if you push the back button, which is just to the right, I think, of the circle of life, it will automate your dome and sound movements. And again, you're totally free to mess around with some of the uh, timings on this, uh, where it actually does. That comes a little bit later on in the code. But this is just basically listening for that button to be pressed. And we'll put it in automation mode. Again, you get audio cues to say you've gone into that mode or out that mode. So here we go, if we're in that automation, if we're in automation mode, start the timer. So basically that's the internal clock of the Arduino. Starts, it makes a point of whatever the time was when that started. And then randomly it will play a track between track 32 and 52. The, the, the numbers of these tracks is going to become very important shortly, okay? And this is the bit where a lot of people have problems. I uh, know I've helped a few guys out with this specific thing in the past. Uh, okay, so uh, what it's going to say is it will play a random track, and then randomly as well, it's going to send a command to my siren, which is my dome controller, and it will turn a certain amount of trees, and then it will stop, and then it will turn another certain amount of trees. Now you'll notice in here, I've actually, I have actually got a delay of 750 milliseconds, but note that this only gets taken into account if we're in that automation mode. Okay, so that part would get ignored generally unless in the automation mode. Uh, okay, okay, so that's a bit about turning the uh, droid, the droid's head. So I've got it set up to turn minus 45 or plus 45. So that's my upper and lower values because I don't want my dome to spin right the way around because then it ends up randomly not facing the public and they just see the back of his head, which is a bit rubbish. So mine just kind of turns a little bit. Okay, uh, next we're talking about uh, what happens if we push the up and the old one button at the same time. Well, that will turn the volume up. So you can hold the old one shoulder button down and use up and down on the D pad to increase or decrease the volume. Again, just being able to have this sort of control in one controller is just fantastic. Um, the next part of the code is uh, if you're using I2C, which we mentioned before, uh, then you can actually change brightness of your um, dome uh, Arduino controls. I say I don't use that. Uh, there's a bit in there about uh, using my fire extinguisher. So basically if I do L1 and up, it's going to open that, it's going to send a digital write to that servo. Um, so on my on my gas canister I've got a little 3D printed um, lever which has got a servo attached to it, so it basically pulls it down and then lets it go right up. Okay, now we get on to some of the really sexy stuff uh, with regards to sound that uh, the Arduino Power and Sketch is capable of doing. Um, and this is one of the things that really sold it for me. Uh, it's the fact that you can use combo buttons. Okay, so typically on an Xbox controller, you've got your X, Y, A, and B, or whatever the buttons are. With this code, you can actually tell it that you're going to hold another button down at the same time, which will then influence those other buttons, those A, B, C, and D buttons. So uh, it may be that you've got <coughs> some happy sounds on the A button, some sad sounds on the B button, <coughs> some whistles on one, and then some sentry noises on another. But what you can do with this is you can set it so that you've got a very specific sound on a very specific button. So if you always want to be able to repeat the wolf whistle on demand, you've got a button that does that. But it may well be that you want to have a load of happy sounds, and rather than like having to go around on different buttons, what you can do is you can actually have all of those happy sounds effectively queued up on one button. 
So you can push it, it'll play a happy sound, push it, play a different type of happy sound. Push it again, plays another kind of happy sound. Like or sad sound, whatever else. Very, very flexible. Really, really flexible. Uh, so basically what this is doing is saying if the B button is pressed, but at the same time as the L1 button, which is left, uh, one of the left uh, trigger buttons, then you can send some stuff randomly to the logic lights. So this is talking over I2C up to your dome, but you're also going to play uh, track three. So this is where you have got a, a specific music track or whatever else in this particular case. But there's also ways to play a random track between tracks 32 and 52. We're going to kind of whistle through this next one a bit because it's all, all these sections of code are also talking about these, these combo loop buttons. But just, just to sort of get the idea that you, you don't, you're not limited to just a single button. You can actually hold one button down and then press another button and it will perform a different action. Very, very powerful. Um, okay, so the next section actually is where it starts talking about setting the speed of your droid. So you'll notice that what it's doing is it's uh, listening for a click on uh, L3, which is basically you're clicking down the left thumb button. Okay, so when you on, so on my version I've got the left hand drive, so if I click that down, that's where it changes the speed at which my droid is going to drive. And it says if the drive speed was 1, it sent it to 2. And if the drive speed was 2, set it to 3. And if it was drive speed 3, set it back to 1. So you kind of loop around. Uh, I also get an audio cue every time I change the uh, speed. Uh, and when it, plays, when it goes on to drive speed 3, it plays it. That's so what it sounds like, I know it's going to go up to the blizzard. Um, OK, so we'll talk a little bit uh, about the next bit again. Dan has done a great job of writing all of these bits of uh, all of these notes in here, okay? So it tells you exactly what is going to happen in this next section of code. Um, so it says if we're in the dead zone, then don't drive. Otherwise, we can drive and it's got ramping, whatever, you know, we set value earlier on for ramping. So this is basically going to be our exponential for the speed up. Um, so having a play with that will sort of show you just how slow or fast your droid is going to get to its top speed. Um, mine, the value I had on mine, which I think was four, it's kind of pretty much instant. Um, have, a, have a play. This is the beauty of it, just to have a play. Re-upload the code, try it. If you like it, great. If you don't, change it, re-upload the code again. Um, some of this stuff here is where the fix went in to fix the turning speed, so it, was turn, it used to turn faster to the right than it did to the left. Um, because the way that your siren, uh, sorry, the way that your um, saber tooth is going to be configured is what's called tank, dri uh, tank drive mode. So it literally is driving like tank drive. So to turn right, the left hand wheel spins up, the right hand wheel slows down, vice versa. If you want to turn on the spot, you put one motor forward and one motor in reverse. On the spot. Exactly the same as the later points we're doing out there, just recording. Likewise, the dome drive, so I've got mine changed over as I mentioned, so that now it's mine's on the right hat as opposed to the left hat, and that's how I change mine over to the left hand drive. Basically, I found every instance where it said right, I change it to the word left, and every instance where it said left, I change it to right. You've got to be slightly careful, obviously, if you don't overwrite all of them and then change them all back to the other way. So just I make it a slight dummy name, I call it right A, and then you can change, look for, do a final replace on right A and change that to left. Yeah, I'm sure you get the idea. I would also recommend any point that you're about to change something. If you've uploaded a version to it and, it, and the droid kind of generally works, but maybe it doesn't quite do what you're going to do, before you go and change the code, just take a copy of it, back it up, copy and cut, do control A, highlight all, Paste it out to Notepad. This is all plain text, okay? Stick it in Notepad, you can always copy it back again. Um, and that's it. We're at the bottom of the code. So it's it's a little scary to be uninitiated, okay? There's a fair bit of, you know, there's some maths in there that you have to kind of think about and consider. But generally speaking, this should be fairly readable to anyone with a reasonable level of intelligence, okay? And I don't mean that disparagingly at all. If you're building droids, then you're 
you know, you're probably pretty serious about this stuff because it's not a small investment. So, as I, as I said before, the code will do what you tell it to do, all right? If you think it's gonna do something that it doesn't do, it's you that haven't thought the process through correctly to actually write that code as you want it to do. Don't get frustrated with it, don't get upset with it, just logically think about what it did. If it turned, you know, if it, if it was going in a straight line and it turned off to the right, well maybe it's a mechanical thing, maybe you've got a leg slightly offset to the right. But just think about things in a logical way, break them down into little right sized chunks, and you'll get through the starting up problems. So, let's just jump back into the presentation. Picks these up. The first, it's going to count 007 as my first file. 
So if I say play track number one, it's going to play track number seven. All right? Absolute bombs. No, complete pain in jacks. Uh, that was probably a bad choice of files to copy. Let's go and find. Give me one second. Uh, I recognise the uh, name of the particular file. No. So uh, I'm going to go and copy the file and then sound to our two. I'm just going to paste them onto my micro SD card. Again. The order, okay, so the order's coming not too, too bad, I'm also going to just get rid of those top two. Okay. Again, I've got this at the moment, it's called a data modified order. This, the order you sort them into here, is just your computer looking at that SD card, okay? Your Spark Fan MP3 player, or whichever kind of MP3 player, does not have this kind of intelligence, okay? It won't sort them into that order, it will play them in the order they were written to the SD card. So this is the this is the deal with you, okay? You need to go and find some software called Drive Sort. Okay, I mentioned Drive Sort when we were talking about software before. Oh, I see. Uh, can we start the slideshow from there? What would you like? I yeah, F5. I've done that. It's taken me right back to start. So. Uh, I was a chef that tried to do that, didn't I? Okay, it was all right. Beautiful, thank you. Hang on, I've got time to use that. So, the part of the entry we mentioned is largely irrelevant to the board. Uh, and it's determined by the order the files were written onto the micro SD card, okay? So, go and find yourself a copy of Drive Source. Right, drive sort. Um, the, the first time I came across this was before I even built my R2. I built um, an E11 blaster for my Storm Cookie Stone, which runs Arduino, runs a whole load of sound stuff in it as well. And the files were all over the place. Okay, so when I pulled the trigger, it would play whatever the hell sound I had. No idea what it was doing. So then I found out that, that and, and that was running um, the MT5001 um, sound player. Incidentally, Spark and MP3, quite expensive board, probably 25, 30 odd pound. The MT5001, one pound 50, go figure. Mm. And it's a micro SD capable board as well, so you just, again, micro SD card. And that's why when I build the Proton packs, the Ghostbusters guys, I use this other board. It's a damn sight cheaper, and it works. It works in a similar sort of way. You have to kind of rewrite the code as well. Like instead of the library saying stop the sound, which is nice and easy, you actually have to go and give it some serial commands to tell it to start and to stop and things like that. So anyway, price sort is your friend. Uh, so we're going to go and throw that into price sort. So this is price sort. Very, very straightforward and simple to use, okay? Uh, at the moment, I've still got my micro SD card plugged in. I copied all those files to it a moment ago, and the order, who knows, okay? We have no control over that. Now, there is one way of getting around that, and that's by copying every file individually, okay? Which is fine, until such time as you decide that track 15, you actually want it to be a different kind of sound, instead of going, really, you want it to go, Broom. okay? The moment you copy that file, that's it, your order's gone. Okay, that file is no longer file number 15, it's now file number 38 or whatever the last one was that was copied. Okay, so you need a utility like DriveSort. Now, I'm a PC user, laptop, whatever else. Uh, Mac, if there's a version for Mac, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm sure there probably is, or there's probably some way of sorting the order of your files on Mac. Anyway, this, I'll give you a very quick demo of how this works. Dead easy, okay, it's four buttons you need to press. First thing you need to do is open the disk. Now bear in mind, your micro SD card is known as a disk as far as your computer is concerned. Uh, so you can see there, I've got disk two, FAT32, R2 UK, that's just the name of the SD card. So I'm just gonna, say, it's already highlighted that, it thinks that's the one I want to play with. So I'm gonna say, okay. And there you can see all of those files, and in a reasonable sort of sense, sensible order, as it happens, because I did, you know, just got the whole lot. But let's say, uh, just for fun, let's go and find something else. So I'm going to copy that file there, which has nothing to do. Double click with my accent, sorry. Um, so let's go and copy that file. Yeah, because Drive Source got it open, so I'm just going to 
was that. So I'm just going to go and stick uh, a random file in the middle here. Okay, so um, you can now see that I've got track over onto Chul, which has nothing to do with R2, uh, and it was you know, back at the top there. So if I go over and drive sort again, say OK. So you've noticed O12 Chul is not in numerical order. Okay, it's not where you would expect it to be. And in fact, it's probably going to be right at the bottom because it was the last file that was written to the car. Okay? So my order now is gone. That's it. Okay, if I copied all those files individually, taking me you know, a few minutes to do that manually, and if I just made one mistake, your order's gone. So this utility sorts that out for you. So we open the disk by doing that first button. We then skip across to the third button, which says sort the current folder. Tap on that and it sorts that folder into the order of the name of the file. Okay? Now, that other file was started here at 0, 1, and 2, which is why it's now at the top, because 0, 1, 2 actually comes before 0, 1, S, if you see what I mean. All right, so notice the order of my files has now changed. What I next need to do is to save the current folder. So this now writes the information back onto the SD card. And then finally, I push the red one, which says close to this, and that's it. I've now popped it out and it's done. Okay? You must do that process every time you change a file, even if it's the same name file, okay? If you've got, I know, 15 chortle, and then someone comes up with a great clean version of 15 chortle, if you call that file 15 chortle, copy it to your card, you change the order. Okay? You must then re go through drive sort, rewrite the files back to the card. It takes a second. Okay? But absolutely crucial that you do that, otherwise your sounds will go out the house. Did that make sense? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, right. Uh, there's the URL if you want to download a copy of drive sort. That's where it's currently located. Again, just search from the internet if you want a copy. I've got a copy here. Uh, as far as BCs are concerned, there's two files. There's drivesort.exe and there's drivesort.ini. That's it. Okay, you don't need any sort of clever libraries or anything else. Just two little files. Uh, and there's a demo we've done it. So just open drivesort, open the disk, sort the current folder, save the current folder, close the disk, eject the file. Okay. Very quick, very straightforward, but absolutely critical if you want your droid to play the sounds you're expecting it to play when you're expecting them to play. That's about it, really. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Great! <laughs> Steve, on the, um, well, you've got the uh, auto dome yes. controls, you've got you 750, yeah. 750 delay on that. Yeah. The auto uh, works alongside driving, so does that not affect your driving? Right, yes, thank you for mentioning that. Okay, so I did mention earlier that it's not perfect, okay, and this is one of the things that does have an effect, okay. I never drive my droid whilst it's in auto mode. Mm. I take, always take it out of that. If I'm in the track mode, my droid has its drives disabled. Michael's absolutely hit the nail on the head there, and it may well be because of that 750 millisecond delay. If I'm driving my draw, and I found this out the hard way on one of the first times I took mine out, or when I was practicing with it, I was driving along, put it in the track mode, took my thumb off the stick, and just for a, half a second or so, it just carried on, without me telling it to do that, okay? And, but if you take it out of the track mode and you drive it, it doesn't happen. So it probably is that 750 millisecond delay. Yeah, so it'd, be, it'd be easy enough to flick, to flick that over to millis rather than using the delay, wouldn't it? I oh, guess. 100%. Yeah. 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 Yes. It's, pro it, it's probably the right thing to do, but I, I, I decided at that point that I was just never going to do just that. Just leave it, yeah, yeah. Um, and besides, if, I, if I'm driving my droid around, I want control of the dome and I want control of the sounds to be stood at the time. Hmm. Because the worst thing you can do is to, you know, drive up to a member of the public who's clearly in distress and then do the loudest sound that it can do, you know. I'll, if, if, if I've got a little kid and they're looking a bit upset, I'll kind of go up to them and go, you know, sort of play little kind of quiet, sad sounds until they come out of their shell a little bit. So, you know, you don't want to go up and blast their eardrums off. But, 
Why not? <laughs> oh, I've, I've, no, I've never done that. It's a little brat who pushed my PSI's in. Sorry, there was another question up there. What was that last video recommended again? Yeah, um, uh, let me go. Uh, I think it's a, a TP3116. I'm pretty sure it's yeah, TP3116. Uh, I'm not connected to, to the internet on my laptop, but I'll certainly go on the phone. AliExpress, couple of pounds. They are ridiculously good, absolutely crazy good. I use them on all the proton, so the proton packs I built for the Ghostbusters guys. Um, I'm the ones I'm building now are louder than what's known as the Ben Kent pack, which is the the standard across the globe for a loud pack. Um, the guy who builds the shells of the packs that I put the electronics into, he's got an original Ben Kent pack. My pack's out of years now, and he's very very upset about it. <laughs> Any other questions? What yes, the MT3 uh, player called? Any MT? Uh, the, the, the other ones, it's an MT5001, uh, sorry, it's a WT5001M02 28P. So what actually popped out, the, the actual dongle, the USB dongle popped yeah, out of your shield? Yeah, it popped out from previous, it just yeah. slipped, but it lost control from the controller. Okay. okay. I can't answer that directly because I don't know. I don't know the answer. It's just something that I found. It's sure. Like but it absolutely highlights a very important thing, and that's to make your droid, for want of a better description, shockproof. Uh, I've got personal experience with this. You may have seen on the forums, I actually came up with a potential uh, badge with the dome off on the floor and someone looking into my back. Um, I've had that personally, I was doing a big parade um, about two and a half, no, about a mile drive up and down on public roads and it rattled into bits, absolutely shook into bits. And what happened was he suddenly stopped, absolutely stopped dead. I had to you know, take the dome off in front of the public. I had a couple of people kind of trying to shield it. And what had happened was one of the uh, header pins had come out uh, that talks to my safety tooth. So basically the cereal had popped out. So after that point, hot glue across all of them, keep everything as shockproof and as, as vibration proof as you can. <coughs> Excellent recommendation. Uh, any other questions or comments? Happy to help. If, say if you, if you want. If you want files, if you want the MP3 files, I've got them all here. I've got some spare uh, micro SD cards as well. So if you, you, if you want one, come and see me. I'm happy to write them onto the, in the correct order for you, whichever version. So on my Android, um, I actually have a spare MP3 micro SD card taped to the inside of the Droid because at some events I want to be able to do the, the fun sort of fun sounds. I hate them, uh, but the uh, the, the uh, cantina music in the R2 style, you know, with all the beats and whistles, because some, some events they want that sort of thing. Most of the time I've just got a fairly sort of base level where I've got a boosted version of the layer message and things like that. So all of those sorts of things. If you want copies of it, please find me. I'm more than happy to copy that across for you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Happy to, happy to take it.